So, hi everybody, and welcome to the Gallatin Pollinator Initiative Workshop. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Jillian Rowe, and I'm a Montana Conservation Corps fellow, kind of a mouthful. Um, basically means I've been interned here at the Gallatin Conservation District for the summer. Um, now I can put a name to the face if I've been emailing you, which I'm sure I've been emailing some of you this summer for the program. So this is our first workshop. Uh, some of you might not know, but it's pretty new. This is our first full year doing the program. So with COVID, this is the first time we've kind of been able to put people in the program or interested people in the program together. So we're very excited. See how this goes. Uh, love feedback and maybe do some other kinds of events going forward too. So basically for the workshop setup, we're going to start off with a presentation from me on the program. If you're already in the program, this will sound a little familiar to you, but we are going to be recording this so that people online can view it and learn a little bit more about what the Pollinator Initiative is. And then we'll go into our presentations from some of our speakers. And then after they present, we'll just do kind of a big Q&A. Some of their expertise overlaps. So I think it would be better just kind of have more of a conversation and people can jump in and answer multiple questions. So if you have an agenda as well as a note sheet, people at home have stuff there too to take questions down as you go if you don't want to forget about them. And then lastly, we can do a tour of our gardens. We'll kind of do the end of our growing season, but we still got some good stuff out there. And we'd love to tell you guys more about what we can do at the GCD. We have an informational table back there that people can explore as well as some more information around the room, snacks, we have our seed pickup table over there that if you came to pick up seed or if you're new to the program and you want to sign up, we can handle that over there. So that'll be a time that people can kind of go as they please if they need to be somewhere later or hang out and enjoy the outside space and see food. Okay, so for my portion, we're kind of going to get a little overview of the program go over the history of the program because it's existed longer than it has here at the GCD, about our seed mix options, as well as how you can get involved. And then I think the most exciting part and the new part for everybody will be how we're doing thus far, given that we've been in the program for about a year. Okay, so about the program, the program we have is two main objectives. The first one, obviously creating pollinator habitat. We do this by giving out free pollinator seed to residents of Gallatin County. And now we have people who have small backyard plots, whether they live downtown in Bozeman or Belgrade, all the way up to 2,500. And I think one of our participants even has 5,000 square feet of seed. So we kind of work with people based on what kind of land options they have. Some people start small and then it's a great program that we've been able to put on for Gallatin County residents that is aimed at promoting the habitat. But on top of that, you know, once we have this habitat established, as well as just talking about the program in general, we're able to educate the community on the importance of pollinator health. So even if people aren't able to necessarily have a plot in their backyard where they pay rent or they just live in an apartment, this program has been a source for people to learn about pollinator health. And then hopefully, once everyone's plots are doing great, we can do some things and have some people come out and see how the pollinator plots are going. And it'll just serve as a great way to have some signage or different ways to teach people in the community. So the history it actually started in the Lake County Conservation District in 2016. And from there, they did a lot of the front, front um, front work when it comes to making all the signage, together a ton of information that they then dispersed to other conservation districts across the state. So we were thankful to basically take everything that they gave us and adapt it for the Gallatin County climate, as well as just any information or our logo as we have says Gallatin Conservation District on it. Um, so yeah, so they were a huge, huge help in it. They definitely don't want conservation districts to have to repeat everything they did. You know, most CDs are, are pretty small and don't have a lot of manpower. And so they've been really instrumental in kind of getting it kicked off around the state. And so then in 2020, September 2020, just last year, we picked it up. Our previous natural resource specialist, Sarah Bowman, was the one that kind of got the project started. We received a grant that allowed us to buy the seed as well as some educational materials 
for um, educators in Gallatin County, which you'll see up on the board over here. So we pulled in, I don't know the exact amount that we got for the grant, but we basically pulled in for a larger sum of money so that we could get a bunch of seed and distribute it out to other conservation districts that are closer by that don't have as much manpower. And it's easier for one guy to write the grant versus a bunch of small grants. And so it was really nice. I was able to actually go and drop off the seed to some of the people there in Beaverhead, as well as Flathead and Lewis and Clark. So it was great to meet those people and kind of help them get the pollinator initiative started there. Oh, backwards. <laughs> okay, so our seed mix options, which will be familiar for those who are in the program, but we have both the conservation seed mix and the native seed mix. So conservation seed mix has both native and non-native species. I know sometimes when you say non-native, people get really scared and they don't want to use it, but we basically suggest this for those who are coming from an area that has more of disturbed land, there might be more weeds that it needs to compete with, and those non-native species are really good at out-competing the weeds. So one thing we suggest is if your goal is to eventually move to the all native species is you can start with the conservation mix, get those established, have a couple years of that and then move into planting the native seeds because once the weeds are a little more under control, it's easier for the natives to establish there. So we'll have more talk about this kind of stuff with Chris Mahoney when he talks about some site prep, but we as the conservation district kind of can talk to you guys about what your site looks like you know, what your goals are for the plot and help you pick which seed mix is best for you. Um, both have plants that bloom at different times in the season, which is really great for pollinators all year round. Um, they all have beautiful colors. Um, of course, there's some overlapping species as we have natives in both mix. And then some have a grass option as well, which serve as habitat for the bees, which you can choose to put in your plot or omit if it's a smaller plot. Maybe you just want it to be wildflowers versus grasses as well. So we can have more information on this on our website. You can always ask questions. And yeah, that's the seed mix option. So how to participate. A great start is coming through these workshops. So you can ask us questions. But we have an interest form here today, as well as online, that everyone who participates just has to fill out. Basically, just gives their contact information so I can bug you all the time and make sure that you got your stuff going on and your site address so that if we ever need to come out and check it out, we can do that as well. And then you submit that form to our staff and then we'll just basically make sure everything looks okay, give you any advice. You guys can come on in, no worries. <laughs> Hi. Um, we will check out the form that you submitted, help you come up with a plan to prep your site. Um, you know, the basic questions on if you have irrigation or not, just to get a good sense of what your land is looking like. And then all you have to do is pick up your seed, sign that form, and get on prepping. So we're really there all across the process. Um, some people need a lot of help, or some people are more experienced with gardening, and they kind of go run off and do their thing. So we're there to help with however much you need. Um, and yeah, so it's fairly easy to participate. Once you get your seed and your site prepped, then you're kind of ready to go. Okay, so this is the part that I'm really excited about. So our one-year progress update. So we have over 70 participants in the program thus far, and that is not including people that have just expressed interest in those that are going to be picking up their seed and everything this for this fall planting. So we have folks from Manhattan, Bozeman, Belgrade, Churchill, and Three Forks. Uh, a goal I really have for next year is to try and reach um, portions of the county in the southern part because we're up here, it's a lot easier to reach uh, the towns that are directly surrounding us. So we're kind of working up some ideas of how we can get people in a larger radius um, going because there's pollinators everywhere. So we need to put the habitat everywhere too. Uh, so we distributed almost 85,000 square feet of seed, which is around two acres. Now this isn't all 100% planted, but by the end of 2020, that should be. Some people had to adjust their plans based on the crazy drought year that we had. And so I think that that's the goal we're looking to hit by the end of 2020. And then I'm excited to see how that grows coming into spring. Of, I said 2020, it's 2021. End of 2021. <laughs> and then going into 2022, see how that number is. 
And then, like I said, we have a wide range of plot sizes, which I think is really important for people to know. Sometimes they just have a small backyard. They might not think that what they're doing is significant, but any amount helps. And you'll see pollinators at any size pollinator garden. And so we have from 40 square feet up to 5,000 right now. And we're willing to kind of work around with those numbers, whether you want to make it bigger or smaller than those. <clears throat> All right, so that's the end of my presentation. I kind of talk fast when I'm presenting in front of people. So we are going to have this recording online, whether you want to go back and look through it if you missed something, or for those or friends that maybe weren't able to attend, you can direct them to that. Um, and so now we can hear from some of our presenters. We have Heather from All the Buzz Honey. She helps at our farmer's market. Thomas is an MSU grad student who's going to talk about some native pollinators, as well as Chris, who is a NRS, NRCS member in Bozeman. He's going to be answering some questions on site prep. So like I said, we're going to kind of keep the questions till after the presentations, because I think people will be able to jump in and sort of answer <coughs> the same question, but maybe they have different perspectives on it. And so you can write those down or keep them in your head and we'll get started with Heather. Thanks. Great. Yeah, of course. So I'm from, I'm from uh, All the Buzz Honey Farm. Um, loved bees my entire life and got started very slowly. So this goes into, it, it ties in with your pollinator plot. So if you're interested in pollinator plots, you might be interested in backyard beekeeping. Um, starting off with honeybees is probably a very overwhelming thing for anyone who's never had any beekeeping background. And so when I started looking into beekeeping, I wanted to jump right into honeybees, but <laughs> I did some research and thought, I don't want to do this by myself, I want a partner. So until I found a partner, I researched backyard beekeeping, and the easiest way to get started is actually in these little houses. You'll see them for sale. Uh, they'll online in Walmart. I mean, they're all over the place. These little, they don't always look like this. Sometimes they're just like a house with all these different holes in it. You'll see at Costco or whatever. So these are for solitary bees. So honeybees, believe it or not, there's like 21,000 species of bees in the world. And honeybees are a very small part of that. Social bees are a very small part of that. Most bees are solitary bees. So they don't have a hive, they don't make honey, they live their entire lives alone. So this is a solitary hive right here, or a solitary house. These are my leaf cutter bees. There's different types of solitary bees. The leaf cutters and the mason bees are the ones that are the easiest to, to take care of in your backyard. So your kids could do this. This is very inexpensive to get started in, and that's why I recommend it for people who want to try beekeeping. This, these guys are superb pollinators. Mason bees and leaf cutter bees actually in a lot of ways out in honeybees and pollination. So if you want to keep your yard and your garden, your trees, your fruit trees, all of that pollinated double, triple your yield, you want to try out with something as simple as these little houses. So the typical solitary bee, these are just reeds, natural reeds. Mason bees you can actually use cardboard tubes as well. And the handout I gave was the information from Crown Bees. That's where I got started. So I really suggest going to their site. They're wonderful. And you can get a lot of information. They sell kits. My husband made this, so you can make these yourself. They're super easy to just build a little house and you can buy the reeds. What most people do when they think, oh, I want to get bees in my backyard, they go to Walmart or they order on Amazon and they get one of those little bee houses and they stick it in their backyard just like my dad did and nothing happens. No bees come and it's full of wasps by the end of the summer. And those are beneficial wasps mostly. So there, there, there are beneficial wasps that actually pollinate and they control pests. So not all wasps are bad. Um, but your pollinator house, at the, you get discouraged at the end of the summer, you have no bees. So you either do what my dad did, give me his house, or you throw away. <laughs> so if you really want to do pollinator bees, that's why I gave the handout for crown bees. 
the best way to do it is get yourself a house, make a house, however you want to do it. You can get them very inexpensive. Um, and then you want to order your bees. You don't want to just wait for the bees to come. You will get some native bees that will house themselves with your leaf cutters or your mason bees. But you want to order your bees from them. You'll get this, get the little eggs in a box and you put your box out when it's the right temperature and you'll, mason bees are spring bees, leaf cutters are summer bees. So your mason bees are gonna come out for your first flowers, your fruit trees, and then the leaf cutters are your garden bees. They're for your flowers and you know, your garden that's growing in the middle of the summer. So you'll put it out, they'll come out, they'll emerge from the box when they hatch and you get a little thing of scent and that's the important thing. You'll get leaf cutter scent for leaf cutter bees and mason bee scent for mason bees. And you wanna put the scent inside your house. Mm -hmm. And when the bees emerge, that scent will keep them in this location. Once you do that, the first season, you'll never have to do it again. I've never bought scent. I've never bought bees. All I do is change out these tubes every once in a while because they do get full of pests. And you'll notice after a couple of years, you'll have a less bees coming out of your, your house. So you do want to keep track of that. Um, and about every two, three years, I'll just get rid of, I'll get rid of all the tubes and get new tubes and stick them in here. Um, but really there's no upkeep. I mean, they hatch out every year. I have hundreds of bees by end of June, first of July, and they're just buzzing all over. These are all in front of my, beside my kitchen window so I can watch them and they're just everywhere. They're very gentle bees. They don't sting unless you smush them or your kids can sit right in front of the, the hive, the house and watch them. I watch them all day coming in and out with their bright colored little leaves. And so that is the main difference between um, the leaf cutter and the mason. And why I choose the leaf cutter is it's easier for me. The mason bees require mud to, to put inside the tube. So in this tube, you have probably between 15 and 20 eggs. And so the, the, the female is the only one who does this. The male's sole purpose is to mate. When they come out, the males mate with the females, males die a couple days later. The female spends the entire summer laying eggs and feeding them. So she will go in, she'll cut some leaves. So you will have little holes leaf cutter bees you have little holes in the leaves of some of your garden plants or your trees doesn't hurt the plant doesn't kill anything and they sometimes will take petals so sometimes you'll see really bright colored yellows and pinks inside here um, and they pack that and then they lay their seed uh, lay their egg and then they make a little loaf they call it a pollen nectar loaf and they stick that in there and then they make another wall and an egg and a loaf and a wall and so the leaf cutters mm -hmm. use leaves, whereas the mason bees use clay, clay mud. Well, I had a really hard time where I live in Three Forks keeping that clay mud in my yard and keeping it moist enough so that the bees could get it. So for me, the mason bees just took off and I finally stopped buying them and trying to keep them because they just, there's not enough clay in my area for them. So mm -hmm. they went somewhere else. But the leaf cutter bees have just they, they're prolific, they expand. I have these houses, many of them, and I can put new ones every year and they'll fill them. So you really have very little upkeep, very little work, very little time involved, and they do pollinate. Wonderful job of pollination. So those are the differences. Um, I, I would suggest if you want to try both, you can. Um, I did the first two years, I did because the mason bees come out first. Um, and then the leaf cutter bees are later. They only live about four to six or five to eight weeks, depending. Um, so they, they just last for a few months of the summer, um, just like a honeybee. Honeybees only last four to six weeks as well, but they keep, you know, hatching and going through the year, whereas these only hatch once a year. You're only going to get these guys once a year and the mason bees as well. Um, but um, they do pollinate well. And like I said, very inexpensive, fun way to get started in beekeeping. Um, honeybees are a whole different, whole different ball game. <laughs> I have them as well. I moved from these into honeybees and then we got the honey farm, me and my partner, Christy. Um, and so now we're definitely into honeybees. So if you like honey, um, but you don't want the work, just buy honey. 
And <laughs> if you love bees and you want to have your own honey, then then being a backyard beekeeper is wonderful. Um, and I could give you all kinds of ideas on the easiest way to get started in that as well, especially if you only are doing it for yourself uh, in your backyard. It's legal uh, in Montana to you know, be a hobbyist beekeeper and have them in your yard and you have a number you can have. Um, and you just have to check with your city and see what the regulation, regulations are. And three forks, there are none. You can have as many hives as you want, but you know, it behooves you to talk to your neighbors and make sure they're not gonna have any issues with how many beehives you have. So, um, and there's ways to keep the bees in your yard that keeps them from bothering your neighbors too much. So that's another thing you can do. So that's, that's my presentation. If you guys had any questions about starting off with one of these really easy, um, you can ask me later. And thank you for your time. Um, I just didn't want it to be the one that was. Okay, so you could do the purple screen. Here it is. Mm -hmm. All righty. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas. I'm a graduate student at Montana State University in Bozeman studying butterflies and bees. And I'm here just to tell you a little bit about some of the butterflies and bees in our area. Um, so this is going to be an overview. There's uh, many more species than I can talk about tonight, but um, they're wonderful to look at and think about. So I figured I'd share a few with you. So first, a few basics on butterflies. There's um, 186 species in Montana, give or take a few, and about 750 species in the US. Um, so there's quite a, a big diversity of butterflies, which is wonderful. And one thing that characterizes butterflies is having four very distinct life stages. So you may remember this if you ever raised butterflies in like kindergarten class or anything like that, but we have the eggs first and then caterpillar larva, and then they go into a chrysalis or a pupa um, where magical you know, transformation occurs while they hang there and they emerge as an adult and then the cycle continues. Um, so that's very distinctive of butterflies and butterflies rely on specific host plants to undergo um, this egg laying and larval production process. So that adults are generalists, meaning that they'll feed on a variety of flowers, but in order to successfully reproduce, they need specific species and each species of butterflies relies on a certain um, type of flower or several types of flowers. Um, so one other thing that's pretty cool is that butterflies um, tend to prefer flowers with landing pads because they're relatively large pollinators. And that includes several of the flowers that are in the seed mixes um, that the Gallatin Chinese pollinator initiative is putting out. So this is Scolardia, a blanket flower here, black-eyed Susan, Maximilian sunflower, all great butterfly pollinating flowers. Um, so a little bit about um, butterflies. The I'm going to throw in a little bit of Latin here, um, not too much, I promise. But Lepidoptera is the um, order of butterflies and moths. Um, so. If you're a very avid butterfly watcher, people call you a lepidopterist. And lepid is actually um, Latin for scale or lepido. And then terra is for wing. And you can see here, this is a photo I took um, through a microscope at my lab um, of a Melissa blue butterfly. Um, the coloration on their wings are made up of these tiny scales made of chitin. Mm -hmm. It's actually the same material um, that fungi or mushrooms use make their cell walls. So pretty cool, um, really fun. If you ever get a microscope, look at some butterfly wings, they're incredible. Um, so now I'm just gonna go through a few of the common um, groups of butterflies in our area. 
So you probably are all familiar with swallowtails. Um, they are really large, colorful, black and yellow or black and white butterflies. Um, the larvae mostly feed on like aspen and cottonwoods. Um, and again, um, very small amounts of damage that butterfly larvae make. So don't worry about your trees in that regard. So we've got three species that are common out here in Western Montana, two-tailed swallowtail, which is actually the largest butterfly in Western North America. Um, it's about this big, really pretty spectacular to see. And it actually has four tails, two on each wing. And then we've got Western tiger swallowtail and the tail swallowtail. This is usually found at a little bit higher elevations in the mountains. Um, so those are all really cool species and they love gardens. So if you're in the city and you just have a small, you know, patch of where your pollinators, you'll often still get um, swallowtails, which I think is pretty sweet. Um, related to swallowtails, although looking quite different, are Parnassians. Uh, and these are more up in the mountain meadows, so you're less likely to see them in your yard, but it's possible. And they've got these wonderful translucent wings and then red spots there on their hind wings. And um, this is actually a species, um, Clodius Parnassian, great name, that uh, my lab and my advisor, Diane Gavinsky, studies um, for her research up in Grand Teton National Park, looking at how climate change might impact the species. Um, and they're really fuzzy. So they're really, really cool butterflies. You can see they're kind of adapted to that cold air elevation environment. So now we have the white butterflies, clearer day, uh, and they are really common. Um, cabbage white, also called cabbage moths, but they're actually butterflies, are really common if you grow broccoli or cabbage or Brussels sprouts, which is all the same species actually of plant. Um, that's this butterfly's larval host plant. So it's kind of the one butterfly that people tend to not like. Um, and in some ways, for good reason, they're actually an import from Europe where our um, brassicas also came from. Um, so they're not, they're not a native butterfly. Um, so I wouldn't encourage, you know, like, oh, but if you're excited about seeing them, you know, they are a butterfly, they are still amazing. Um, but um, they are one non-native but butterfly. Kind of amazingly, all of our other species are native, which is pretty cool compared to plants. Most of our plants that we see around us are non-native, so butterflies, very high proportion of my natives. This one is related to the cabbage white as a native called the Becker's white, and it really likes sagebrush habitats. So if you're in a sagebrush area, you might see this one. Really wonderful underwing there with the yellow veins and, and green. Um, and I do my research on roadsides. This is actually a fairly common butterfly along the sides of roads. It's tolerant of a fair amount of disturbance. Um, this is another common group um, that you'll see um, you know, in cities, along roadsides and kind of disturbed areas, the sulfurs, um, they're really difficult if you're trying to learn butterflies to species because there's um, 10 to 12 species that all look about the same. These are actually different species, the orange sulfur and the clouded sulfur. And there's also polydny sulfur, several other species. Um, but they're beautiful. They're yellow butterflies. They're about this big. Um, You've probably seen them before, and if you pay attention, you'll see more. Um, and then next is the fritillaries. This is also a really challenging group to learn to species, but they're pretty distinctive if you just want to learn that this is a fritillary. There's a lot of species that look very similar to these two, um, the underside and then there on top. Um, and they um, often like violets as their host plant. Um, and they're pretty common in the summertime, um, particularly in areas if you're near forested habitat or meadows, fritillaries like those a lot. Um, so next we have one of the largest groups of butterflies, the nymphalids, or the brush-footed butterflies, and they have quite a bit of diversity. So we've got our admirals, our tortoise shells, ringlets, our, actually, this is our state butterfly of Montana, the morning cloak, comes out early in spring. It's often the first one that people see in the springtime. And then, of course, our monarch, which is the butterfly that most people are most familiar with. Um, so going into this a little bit more, does anyone know what this butterfly is? Or anyone have a guess? This is a um, painted lady, which 
is another pretty familiar butterfly. It's often one that people, um, when they're doing pollinator education, people will raise these from eggs, just like sometimes people do with monarchs. Um, and it's an, it shows this photo, kind of an example of an interesting characteristic of the brushfoot butterflies, which is that big family. They only have four legs, you know, insects tend to have six legs. So if you ever seen them, you're like, oh, they're missing two legs. It's actually the whole, this whole group of butterflies evolved to just have four legs as adults. So kind of interesting. Pace ladies are super cool. Um, they're very common and they're actually uh, found worldwide. They have the largest distribution across the world of any butterfly. And in Europe, they um, recently found that they actually migrate um, in the jet stream from Northern Europe all the way down to Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So a migration that's even longer than our monarchs here in North America. So, and you know, they're about this big. So butterflies are pretty incredible. Um, and another plus is that their larval food plant or one of their larval food plants is a Canada thistle, which is a weed that a lot of people are trying to get rid of. And so they, their caterpillars will eat those thistles, which is great. Um, this is a red admiral, another pretty distinctive and common lovely butterfly. And I was um, just thinking on the way here that it's we're kind of getting into winter time, so you're probably not going to remember a lot of these names, but hopefully this will be recorded. And so if you're, you know, looking at seeing butterflies in the springtime, you can look back at this um, and learn some of the species that you're seeing. Um, this is actually my favorite butterfly species called Weidemeyer's Admiral. Um, I just think it's stunning and it has this sort of unique flight pattern where it has these very flat wing glides, almost like a paper airplane, a little bit. Um, and this is a related species. It's less common here in Western Montana called the Lorcan's Admiral. It's about the same, but it's got those orange tips to their wings. And these, this is a photo I took of some that are doing an activity called mudding where they get uh, mineral nutrients mm -hmm. out of wet soil. Um, so butterflies, their only mouth parts that they have are basically like a straw, so that long curled pr proboscis. Um, and so it's pretty hard for them to get food. So they mainly feed on nectar, but they still need things like nitrogen and sodium and calcium, some of those nutrients we get you know, through hard foods. So for them, I mean, like a wet area of wet soil, is really handy because they can suck up those nutrients with their straw mount parts. So that's maybe a second reason you might want to try and leave a wet patch of soil in your garden somewhere. You might find that butterflies are kind of going for that. And swallowtails really love um, muddy. So now we have onto our tortoise shells. These are a really cool group um, in that many butterflies will winter either as eggs or caterpillars. So they spend the winter in that life stage. Tortoise shells typically spend the winter as adults. And so you might actually see an adult tortoise shell like um, in the inside corner of your shed or under one of your eaves or kind of tucked into a little corner in the middle of winter, which is pretty amazing. Um, and they're able to basically lower their body activity so that they can survive the extreme cold. So we've got California tortoise shell is this one up here and then Milbert's tortoise shell is that one down there. All right, and now the monarch. And this is actually one of the focal species for my research. Um, and it's really in sharp decline right now. So there's not very many migratory Western monarchs left, fortunately. Studying um, tens of thousands of milkweed plants this summer in Idaho, I found two adult monarchs. Mm -hmm. So these are actually photos I took when I studied them many years back in Oregon, and they're much more common. Um, so if you do see one, um, I would encourage you to report it. Um, there's uh, various ways you can do that. If you just look up, you know, reporting a monarch. Um, and a big one here in the West is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. Um, and because at this point, we're like looking for any sightings that are out there. They're getting pretty rare. What was that again, Western? Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. <laughs> it's a bit of a handful. <laughs> But, you know, with Google these days, you look up, I saw a monarch, what do I do? Or, you know, how to report, you right and you'll, find, you'll find it, yeah. Uh -huh. 
Um, is it just in decline around here or? It's the whole Western population is in, is in decline. Um, they've decreased by 99% since mm. the 1980s. Um, and the Eastern population has decreased by about 80%. And so um, they are relatively common, but, but monarchs kind of everywhere are in trouble. Uh, which is one reason why I'm studying them. Yeah. Did, did, did this winter in, in Mexico and Monterey, is that right? Right, yes. Yeah. So the eastern population primarily winters in Mexico and the Waymal fir forests, and the western population primarily winters in California, around Monterey Bay and Southern California on the coast. A little interesting, though, in that here in western Montana and also in Idaho, there appears to be some individuals from both populations that may mm -hmm. summer here, and we're still trying to figure out what exactly is going on with that. Yeah. Um, are you part of the tracking for the monarchs? Yeah. Like the little tracking bead on them. I know what the zoo and stuff like that. Yeah, I am not um, tracking individuals myself, but mm -hmm. I am aware of those efforts, and they're really cool. And if there are, there's a researcher at Washington State University that's putting little stickers on monarchs and doing that tracking. So, see a monarch with a sticker. Oh my goodness, like report that, very exciting. Um, so, and I can talk, I can happy to answer more questions on that um, after as well. Um, it's very interesting. Anyway, I do wanna, before I leave this up here too long, I wanna point out that actually one of these is not a monarch. Um, and it fools a lot of people, including myself before. This is actually a better fly called the Viceroy which mimics monarchs. Um, so <laughs> one, perhaps a good motivator to take a picture if you do see a monarch, just in case. Um, and of course, it's especially tricky because this one I saw feeding on milkweed, uh, which is not their host plant. But viceroys are a related species, but not closely related, um, that has evolved to mimic monarchs because that bright orange and black plumage kind of tells birds and other predators don't eat me. So monarchs get their toxicity from the milkweed that they eat. Milkweed's also pretty toxic. Um, so they've got these bright coloration to say, you know, watch out, don't eat me. And Viceroy is like, oh, well, you know, I'll look like that too. And then I won't get eaten as well. That's what scientists thought. But recently they found that actually, Viceroy's are actually also poisonous and not good to eat. Um, so this is getting a little sciencey, but originally I thought it was Batesian mimicry, where mm -hmm. a harmless species mimics a poisonous species. But actually, they found it's Malarian mimicry, where two poisonous species mimic each other. So then the predator population learns doubly quickly to avoid either. So kind of interesting there. Um, you can see, you can tell the difference by this line that goes across the hind wing that you can see is absent. In monarchs. Um, Viceroys are actually quite a bit smaller too and they fly differently, but it is pretty tricky. They're, pre they're pretty convincing. I have before been like, oh, monarch, and then I took a picture and then I looked back at my picture and I was like, well, it's a viceroy. Mm -hmm. So, and also, I just want to say, monarch larvae are truly incredible, um, just remarkable. And they go through these different instars where they start about this big looking just like that, but tiny, and then they grow to about this size. Um, so, and that's true of many other butterfly species as well, but pretty cool. Um, so, and you know, I'm happy to talk more about monarchs um, later on too, if anyone has any questions, but um, wood nymphs and ringlets are kind of the um, diminutive, you know, drab cousins of this family. Um, they have these wonderful eye spots, though, um, which people think are kind of an adaptation so that if, if birds or other predators are going for them, instead of actually taking out their, their head, which of course would be fatal, they go for the wing, which often butterflies can survive. So that's why you see eye spots, you know, tending as far away from that vulnerable body as they can be. Um, this one's really common. Um, we see it a lot on roadsides, gardens, that kind of thing. Common wood nymph is a bit larger, also pretty common. This guy is a specialty of, of our area in the Rocky Mountains. Um, I've seen it up around in Bozeman, hiking and backpacking, but you probably won't see it lower, lower down as much. Um, all right, 
And then this is a wonderful group, also challenging many species. They, many, many of them look very small or very similar. They are also very small. Um, I took I put that picture of um, on my field text toe just for, for size. They're really small little guys, beautiful blue um, over the top, and then all these wonderful spots underneath. Mm -hmm. And these guys really like mudding, and yeah, that's what they're doing here. And so you can get big, big swarms of them and multiple species too together, um, going for minerals from the mud. And then my last butterfly group um, are the skippers. Um, these guys are um, have fatter bodies and kind of these triangular wings. They are almost sort of like a cross between a butterfly and a moth. And there's been some argument as to whether they're true butterflies or not. Um, but they move really fast and they're really common pollinators. Um, I see them in my garden back home a lot. Um, and so they might be one of the first butterflies that you'll attract if you plant some um, flowers in your yard. Uh, we've got woodland skipper here, um, juba skipper, and the uh, common checkered skipper. And there's about probably 18 other species that you might have. So pretty cool, very diverse group challenging to identify. Um, okay, and then that's all I've got on butterflies, but I will say moths are also really cool. Um, there's about 11,000 species in the US, so 750 butterflies, 11,000 moths. Mm -hmm. So often there's just a few experts that can identify many moths, but there are some that fly in the day and are brightly colored and relatively easy to identify. Um, and nocturnal ones are also really important pollinators. So um, my favorite is this white line sphinx moth, which you might see our hummingbird moth that looks like a small hummingbird. Uh, if you've ever seen one, you probably remember it because it's a pretty special thing. Um, they've got these lawn proboscis and they fly around in the daytime or in the evenings. Um, and just like hummingbirds are really, really good pollinators. Um, and then this is another a tiger moth, which is also um, flies during the day and, and pollinates. So and then that's just kind of that's scratching the surface. Um, could do many, many presentations on moths, um, but I, I won't regale a few of those tonight. <laughs> um, all right, and now I've got a quick section on bees. Uh, first, though, bees are unlike butterflies and moths, they're sometimes a little tricky. Um, do people think these are bees? Yes, no? Sometimes I call them bee flies. Yeah, so you got it. So these are actually all flies. Um, but again, with that, we were talking about mimicry. They are mimicking bees um, because bees, some bees sting, flies don't sting. And so they're like, well, we'll look like our more aggressive um, distant relatives. So these are actually all flies. Um, and they are pollinators. They are important. They're great to have in your garden or your farm. Um, some differences, bees have four wings, um, flies have only two, and so you can see just two wings in each of these. And then flies also have much larger eyes and these short little antenna. Um, so how about these? This is, it gets easier. Anyone? Wasps. wasps, yep. Um, so there are some wasps that look quite, quite about look quite a lot um, like bees. These ones are pretty distinctive. Um, some ways to tell them apart, most bees are pretty hairy. Um, they're really, bees are really great pollinators because of all that hair, because that's where the pollen collects. Um, wasps can still be beneficial pollinators, but they tend to be really smooth, and so they don't collect as much pollen. Mm -hmm. And bees only eat pollen and nectar, whereas most wasps are carnivores. And by that, I mean, they eat insects, um, no, but they will go for your hamburger as well. Yeah. Some bees are, are good pollinators, or some wasps are good pollinators too. Um, but in general, wasps are going for insect prey. Yeah. From what I understand, the adult stage is actually only uh, consuming nectar. And they take the meat back to their feeding. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they're feeding their young more insect prey. Um, and meat. And then, yeah, they're consuming nectar themselves, generally. So there's some variation in that, but good point. Um, so 
I think uh, just the diversity of name of bees also is really cool. Um, so I put this together. This is these are all photos from the USGS Inventory and Monitoring Lab, which is a great source for really cool bee photos. So Heather mentioned this: the huge diversity of native bees, four thousand in the lower forty the U.S. and all of these are bees. So you know, we've got blue, we've got green, we've got tiny ones, big bumblebees, um, you know, all sorts of varieties. Um, they're again really efficient pollinators. Um, and then most are solitary, like Heather was mentioning. Some of them live in small colonies like bumblebees. Um, and they've evolved to pollinate our native plants. Um, and so um, many bees are specific to a certain native plant. So that kind of provides a lot of the, the diversity there. And then of course, many are also important crop pollinators and some are really efficient, like mason bees they found are actually much more efficient at pollinating like a crop like almonds than honeybees are. Um, because they will basically go from, you know, tree to tree instead of from flower to flower. So and that, um, and, th and that way they're pollinating between trees instead of pollinating the same individuals on one tree. Um, so native bees are really cool. Um, a little bit about some of these individual adaptations that you've got special bees that pollinate um, squash. Um, ones that evolve pollinate like penstemon or spirelsia, that's low mallow. These guys are actually really cool. I used to live in Utah and they build these little um, towers in the driveway. I can get a picture of later. Um, and we're pretty neat. These are a few photos that I just added in here. Um, Cindy, who's here with me and interning with me, we've been pinning these specimens from my research lately and taking some pictures through the microscope. Um, and they're pretty darn cool. We've got, you know, these wonderful purple eyes on, on this bee, and this is a mason bee, incredible. Um, and then this is actually pollen grains caught in the, the legs of another bee. Um, these are called lawn horned bees here. As you can see, they've got really long antenna. Um, you might see those in your garden as well. Um, so one thing I always try to address when I talk about bees is a little bit of confusion um, because there's sort of this widespread understanding that like bees are in decline, we need to save the bees, um, but exactly which bees need saving um, often kind of doesn't or gets lost or people get confused about. So these are all examples of people saying, you know, we need to save the bees and then they're all talking about honeybees. Um, however, honeybees are actually a European species. They're not native to North America and their numbers are actually growing each year. They're incredibly abundant because we like honey and we use them for pollination services too. So um, certainly beehives, a lot of bees are dying because of uh, pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Um, but because we can split hives and, and basically remake them, um, they're sort of a, like a livestock species where we, they're, they're sort of our agricultural problem. But they're not a conservation problem. So a little bit of a difference there. Um, and so here are some more articles that, that kind of treat this a little bit um, where they're talking about how sometimes commercial honeybees can actually conflict with native bees. Native bees, because no humans aren't taking care of them, they're the ones that are actually more in trouble of extinction. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, like when you're thinking about saving the bees, which there's all of these native species to say honeybees are doing okay, um, although it is certainly challenging to be deep. So there's, you know, there's kind of an interesting um, bit of confusion there, um, which I can go into more if anyone has questions on that. But, um, and then finally, why should we care? Um, insects are declining. You know, there's some pretty scary studies out there um, from like, Germany, 76% decrease in flying insects in the last 30 years, Puerto Rico, 78 to 98%. So um, they're in trouble. Um, and part of that is habitat loss, loss of flowers, herbicides and pesticides is huge. Like, please don't use insecticides is my plea to everyone, <laughs> um, if you can. 
Um, and, and, you know, we really rely on them. Three quarters of flowering plants, um, around a third of food crops, and those numbers kind of vary depending upon your interpretation, but, you know, they're hugely important, both for us and for wild ecosystems. And they've got a lot of threats, you know, monocultures, grazing, herbicide, pesticide use, all can negatively impact them. And then final note is if you're, if there's one thing that's super easy to do for native bees, it is to leave your old stems and your old garden stuff um, mm -hmm. out instead of clearing everything out in the fall. Um, leave it because you might have bees nesting in your soil, in your plant stems, on the bare ground. Um, and they have to spend the winter somewhere. You know, bees don't migrate south. So they are there in, you know, in the garden, on the land, in forms that we don't see. So just think about that. Um, when you're, when, you, you know, I'm kind of a tidy person, I want to clear out all the dead stems, you know, in the fall from the garden. Like, if you can leave those, you might be saving some native bees. Mm -hmm. um, and a few resources, if you're interested in, in getting more into this, butterfliesandmoths.org is a great resource, and I'll leave this slide up, so feel free to take a picture of it or write these down. Bugguide.net, if you see a bug, you don't know what it is, you can upload a photo there, and there's all sorts of experts on there that can tell you what it is. iNaturalist.org, same thing. Um, if you're feeling techie, there's an app called Seek, where you can take pictures of insects and plants and whatever, and it will try and identify it for you, and it's gotten pretty good. Um, not perfect, but it's pretty cool. Um, and then my two favorite butterfly field guides are up there, the Kaufman Field Guide to Butterflies of North America and Butterflies with Binoculars of the West. So those are both great uh, field guide. If you want to get more into this, it's awesome to have. Uh, and then the Natural History Center, obviously the Conservation District, Xerxes Society is great for insect conservation. Um, and then this is a great guide to bumblebees, which are the one group, I would say, of bees that you can identify as a species or um, are a little bit easier. There's a QR code up there, which might be a little bit techy, but it provides a link to a free PDF of that field guide. So if you want to come up later, we can put this up at the end and you can take a picture of it and have a bumble bumblebee field guide. And then my contacts there, um, feel free to reach out if you have questions. And I love this stuff, so I'm happy to talk about it. And thank you. Thank you. And we are going to have the recording, and then possibly I can put the presentation on our website too, so you guys can go back and look at this and not hurt your wrists scrambling for it right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop for that. And then Chris. Uh, if you want to share, go ahead. He's on Zoom for us today. Howdy, folks. Um, I'm Chris Mahoney. I'm the district conservationist for the NRCS. Sorry I couldn't be there today. I'm actually in quarantine right now. Oh. So um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint I did um, on pollinators in general. Can you folks all hear me OK? Hold on, Chris. We've got some feedback. It's a little staticky for some reason. Owl needs to clear its throat. <laughs> Chris, say something again, please. So can you hear me OK? Yeah, we've got feedback. Hold on just a second. Okay, now try. So I'm Chris Mahoney with the NRCS. <laughs> no, sorry. Hold on, Chris. Go off mute and Becky goes on mute. Okay. Hi, computer. Yeah, they can hear you. Okay, Chris, try again. All right, can you folks hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Here, I can. It's, it's up. <laughs> All right, you can go ahead, Chris. Well, I appreciate everyone for coming out and thank you for your time. Um, 
This is a PowerPoint I gave on pollinators in general. So I'm gonna skip over some of these slides because they don't really delve too far into um, seed bed prep, but I thought they might be helpful just to go through them and um, at least for folks to take a look at it. So, so re really we start off, um, you know, we need to have a spot where they can get to pollinators and a spot to lay eggs, right? So just a picture. So then these are things we wanna kinda consider when we're doing pollinators or setting up pollinator habitat. Of course, site selection, preparation, or keys, and then depending on your site is your plants, um, what plants would do well in that climate and soils. I'm gonna provide a, a slide here. So this is, if nothing else, I think folks should really try to get to this website um, it can show you what types of plants would grow on the soils on your property. So essentially, you go to this site and you draw, draw a line around the outside of your property. It has the whole United States. You just zoom in until you get close enough and you just mark the outside, of the bound, outside boundaries of your property and it'll give you your soils plus a ton of other information, helpful information. And I can put this back up and send this out for anyone who wants it. Okay, so my screen here is a little screen. So of course we need sunlight um, for the flowers and the plants to survive, but we also wanna consider what's the slope? Are there weeds present? What's grown in this area before? Was there a dairy on this spot? Or was this uh, a spot that was in corrals prior? What's the history of the site? And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can go to that website, get a bunch of information on the soils, and that'll lead you into what types of plants will survive in those soils. Of course, certainly um, the conservation district, but also NRCS, we could help you um, with that information if you needed more more help, I guess. So. so getting to site preparation. So as was mentioned earlier, first question is, is it gonna be irrigated or is it dry land? Is the next question after that is, is there existing vegetation out there? And if there is existing vegetation, how do we control that so that we can get the plants we want to grow in there? There's a couple of different methods depending on um, the area, the size of the area and your tolerance to chemicals, right? So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on specific situations here in a little bit, but just consider these. So tillage, obviously that's just using a, a machine to till the soil over. Solarization is when you um, put something over the soil. So the sun itself will heat up and kill everything beneath that. Chemical, of course, is when you spray a chemical to kill everything. Cover crops, um, you can use in, in concert with tillage and solarization. So if you have some vegetation that is fairly well established and difficult to kill, you might have to go in there a number of times over a number of years to get that grass out of there so that you can plant your pollinators. Um, and then in, in doing so, cover crops might be helpful. So generally, um, when folks are talking about pollinators, if you have a quarter acre area and you wanna do all, all pollinators, you're gonna have a lot of weeds come in in between those pollinators. So we generally recommend having some grass in that so that minimizes the open space that weeds can come in. And we also wanna encourage folks to have different plants that flower at different periods of time. And we actually have some documents and I can get this to whoever would like to have it um, on when flowers flower. So there's some that will flower early season, mid season and late season. Generally, you want to have a mix so you can provide food throughout the whole summer season. 
And then also we want to consider what's the standing dead, um, what's out there already. So as um, the previous speaker talked about, habitats for overwintering are important. So we want to keep that in consideration or keep that in mind. So I put this slide up there just to kind of give folks a sense of when you're planting plants out there and you're looking at a diversity of species, you want to have plants that grow deep, plants that are shallow, plants that are fibrous, plants that might have a tap root. So this is just an example of how many different plants you could have in one area. And they're all pulling nutrients from different portions of the soil profile. So they're not necessarily com directly competing with one another. Um, this is just a copy of our um, seed mix and how we calculate how many acres to be seeded, how much the seed, pounds, that sort of thing. Um, this is an important few folks, I apologize for that. So then um, how are we going to seed the area? Are we just going to broadcast the seed, throw it out there? Or are we going to use a drill or get it into the soil somehow? So one thing is to consider is if you broadcast the seed, not all that seed's going to get into the soil and germinate. So generally, we recommend doubling the seeding rate. Um, one way to get away from that is if you do seed and then you harrow, and that's just um, a farm implement that roughens the so soil surface and then roll it. So then you pack that seed so it has good seed to soil contact, then you might not need to double the seeding rate. Um, when you're using a drill, you have to be careful on the seed size. So some seeds gonna be larger, that might drop to the bottom of the drill, that might be what you seed first and then all the lighter seed is later in the seeding. So you wanna keep that mixed. Also, you wanna consider the fluffiness of seed. So some seed might not be able to flow through a drill. And then in that case, you might need a carrier. So a carrier could be essentially um, what would be a rice hull or something to help that seed flow through the drill. So something else to consider is management. So how are you gonna control the weeds that are gonna inevitably come back? So we can mow them. You, when, if you wanna mow weeds, you always wanna try to mow them before they go to seed. So, and then you can use a strategy, you can let them come up, almost get to seed, then mow them, let them come up again, almost get to seed and you mow them. You think of this as um, where they're putting their energy. So they're expending all their energy and regrowing. So you, each time you mow them, you're weakening that plant and you're allowing other plants uh, opportunity to, to, to out-compete the weeds for resources. So essentially mowing and clipping are the same. You can use chemicals potentially to spray. There are chemicals out there to just to spray broadleaf weeds. There's chemicals to seed just grass. So depending on what you're using, um, regardless, I would be very careful. Make sure you look at the label because what you spray today, that spray might last into the future. And if you sprayed with the intent of seeding next year, you wanna make sure that that spray isn't gonna last for two years and it might impact the plants you're planting. So then we also talk about disturbance. So you have these early successional plant species which really like open, open environments versus some of these other ones where they might not, they're more adapted to um, shadier or further along successional species. But we also want to leave patches of rough undisturbed grass. And that's, we were talking about that earlier. Um, it might not be right in the pond or habitat. It might be just outside to provide winter habitat for some of the species. I'm not really going to get into this too much. Um, I think this was already covered. I'll just leave this up for a moment. So if anyone can take a quick look. And that's about it. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. 
and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Gonna try and turn. Okay. 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 It's a lot of information. So again, this will be up on our website. It is already 6.06. .06, so if you have other things to do, I thank you guys for like sticking around for while the presenters were talking. So don't feel rude if you need to get along with the rest of your night. But if people are willing to stick around and if the speakers still want to, um, if people have questions, we can do that. Of course, there's always snacks in the back too if people are hungry, but I just want to be mindful of people's time. Um, I definitely enjoy the presentations. So, yeah, we can. Yeah. I have a question about sync prep. Yeah, of course. How, how much attention do you have to give to final grade and rock picking if you're starting with a, with a bare site? Chris might be able to help with that one. Did you hear that one, Chris? I did not hear it very well. I'm sorry. Could you speak up a little bit more? He's still here. Here. Is the owl picking it up? <laughs> Chris is unmuted. No, yeah, he didn't hear the question. <laughs> Should I ask him? <clears throat> yeah. I can hear you. Oh, yeah. Could you ask the question and maybe speak up a little bit more? Sorry. I had a question about site prep and about how much attention you have to pay to final grade and rock picking. Like, how, um, what quality sort of does the site have to be in terms of final grade and rock picking? Does it have to be really good or can it be a little bit rough? So I would say the rougher the better, to be honest. Um, no. For pollinator habitat and gardening, I think um, the more <laughs> places you... Why is it doing this? Oh. It's just kidding, it's the subtitles. <laughs> Let's see if I can hear him. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can hear me. <laughs> so, I Sorry. think you just mooted me. No, we can hear you. You're good. Oh, okay. So I would say the rougher the better. Um, honestly. You know, provide more spots for microsites for plants to come up. Um, you obviously don't want to leave it so that if it's on a slope that you're going to get erosion. Um, but the rougher, the better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the site or planning, you talked about harrowing. Would this a light breaking substitute for harrowing, or do I just Use the drop spreader, drop the seed, and let it go to let it germinate in the spring. So is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I I should have got into this a little bit more too. So um, when you for site prep, you really want to start with a clean slate. So I would recommend killing all the vegetation in the area you want to seed into because it'll allow compete the stuff that you're trying to plant. Um, it'll, especially if you have smooth brome or some other, the, some other, the other um, more aggressive grass species. But I would say um, you could essentially seed it in the late, late fall or early spring. So if you're going to seed it in the late fall, you would, prep the ground, um, get all the vegetation off 
then you would seed it and you could put some straw over the top and then just and when you do this you want to seed it late enough that the ground is almost frozen so that those seeds don't germinate right away they'll germinate in the spring typically we recommend doing fall seeding in areas where you can't get into in the spring very easily but in general i would recommend seeding in the spring because you don't have the potential of having seed germinate early in the spring and then it, you have a real hard frost and killing some of that seed. So if you do it in the spring, um, same kind of scenario, you want to have a clean, clean slate, no vegetation, throw out the seed when the temperatures start to get up above 60 degrees for the soil. And um, and yeah, you could throw on some, and I would recommend looking for some uh, weed-free straw and putting that over the top. But one thing I should touch base too is when you're trying to get the ground clear of vegetation, some of that might take two years. Mm -hmm. So um, if you kill some grass or you thought you killed some grass, it there's a chance that it might come back the next year. So just be heads up on that it could be something you're gonna to have to continually manage down the road. Did I answer your question? Well, I, I sort of, I mean, I'm at, but it might be better to maybe ask the question later and get in more detail. Because my site is cracked. It's been rounded up three or four times. It's been killed. Um, I've got black plastic over it. It'll be two months by mid-October. Um, I checked under it. There is some stubborn narrow that is looking pretty spindly, um, but is still there. And uh, you know, one of my questions coming here today was, you know, should I plant in the fall? Um, it's an unirrigated spot, so it would be dependent on the spring rain to germinate the stuff. So I, I get a lot of questions swirling, but uh, you know, it, it, I was sort of aiming to, to, to plan this plant this fall. I'm sorry, I'm not really hearing everything. I apologize. Yeah, that's probably from <clears throat> the computer issues. Could could someone summarize maybe, and I could call him one on one, unless. Everybody wants or email. Yeah, I can. We could do that. Maybe yeah. share those answers and share my group here. Yeah. Uh, Chris, would it be okay? Would it be okay? Oh, emailed you some questions and then I can send it out to the group and put them on our website. I am working on building an FAQ uh, page for the pollinator program. So every time a new question comes in, we're going to put it up there so that we don't have to field the same question a bunch of times. So this is a good time to get those. And I can always send out a form too, uh, where people can put in questions that they had, or even if you think of them after you leave, and then we can sort of get them all answered at once and I can put them together on our website as well as send it out in an email. Yeah, those are the kind of resources we're trying to build as the program's pretty new. And so that's the kind of stuff that these workshops are, are nice to gauge from you guys. So yeah, thanks. Can you give those if you want to email the questions? Yeah. I know that it's kind of a rough right now. If I want to send my like, yeah. core 15 so we could send those in right away and we'll get yeah. Yeah, answered right away. Yeah, yes. Yeah. You can send them to me. Can you send them out there? Yeah, I can send them around and put them on the website as well. I have a question. Yeah. About the monarchs. Mm -hmm. Why are they? Yeah. Um, so there's probably multiple drivers of that decline. Habitat loss is one one thing. So um, it used to be that um, at the edges of a lot of farm fields, milkweed, which is sort of an edge habitat. Um, and their host plant would grow, but now it's increasingly large farms and monocultures and herbicides. People are able to eliminate milkweed, so that's 
there's been a loss of habitat. For the western population, climate change is, is a big driver. Uh, it's, it's getting warmer earlier, and some monarchs are moving year round in southern parts of California, including now up even around San Francisco Bay. Um, and it's a little unclear if, you know, what impact that's going to have on the population, but it seems like um, instead of going dormant and essentially roosting the winter out like monarchs typically do, more and more monarchs with the warm winter temperatures and the varieties of non-native milkweed plants that are that are ornamentally planted in California, they're not going to that dormant phase, and so they're breeding all through winter, and then many aren't migrating up north in, in the springtime. That's part of it. Uh, there's there's many different possible components, but I'd say habitat loss and climate change are probably the biggest the big ones. Is that why they're doing the tracking to try and see what their migratory is? yeah yeah I mean there's so many questions like where are they going like um, is if they're breeding in the winter will they migrate back north in the springtime or does that mean that they're like fully out of the migrating population yeah two things I may the only butterfly that migrate and also are there some milkweeds they like more than others like I'm from Tennessee but I noticed there was actually a tropical one that I found my butterflies but we have a native one that you know if you put it in they'll eat it but they don't uh, to that first. Yeah, great questions. Um, they're not the only butterfly that migrates. Um, they are the longest distance distance migrant in North America. Painted lady, like I mentioned, also goes on really long migrations. And there's several other butterfly species that migrate shorter distances. And some butterflies have eruptions where they will travel in you know huge numbers over or kind of unpredictable areas depending upon in different years. And so um, a lot of it is pretty complicated. And even monarch migration is kind of like the, the totem example is still, there's still a lot we don't understand that. In terms of milkweeds, native is, is definitely preferred. The tropical milkweed um, has a higher alkaloid or toxin uh, concentration. So there's some concern that it actually might be too toxic, especially with higher carbon dioxide levels, especially from wildfires that also increase alkaloid deposition. It makes it even more toxic. Potentially, it could be too much, too toxic for the monarchs, even though they do lay their eggs on it. Um, so, in short, the native species showy milkweed is the really common native species. Um, showy milkweed, what the species said in the Latin name. Um, that's the one I would recommend planting, preserving um, over other species. The Tennessee is just orange one. Yeah, it's just common milkweed but they don't plant it out enough. there. And actually, butter, butterfly weed too is another milkweed. Tennessee is a little different situation. They have, they, have, they have a whole different variety of species out there. I don't know it as well. Mm -hmm. No, but I think it might be for you. Um, so you say to do stuff in your garden in the fall, not clean up your yard. When in the spring is it then safe to remove that stuff? Because the green right. starts coming up right. at some point. And is that, that is a great question. Yeah. I don't know if I if I have a very solid answer for that. I would say that um, probably once your green plants are sprouting. Um, you'd be in better shape to take some of that out, but um, some of it will probably decompose over the winter potentially, and some of it, if you can leave amidst some new growth, is probably good too. Um, yeah, I will I will try and do some more research on that. If I come up with a more satisfying answer, I'll, I'll let Jillian know. It's a great question. Yeah, it'd be especially you know, one that's specific to this area. Right, you know. right. Yeah, yeah, I'll look into that. I went to a workshop once where they mentioned cleaning up your stuff in the spring and then leaving it sit for, I don't know, a few days. So if there was things hibernating in there, mm -hmm. they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 High enough to that animals aren't going to mess with it at all. Minor, I would say probably, well, minor up on a 
side of the house close to my window, but I wouldn't put them, I wouldn't put them any less than two to three feet okay. uh, off the ground, but you can put them literally anywhere. You can make them out of anything as well. Um, you know, you can use just a, a round can. I mean, people make them out of just about anything. Um, they'll naturally, you know, the native bees will naturally be all over, all over the, all over the outside. You know, and they also, a, a huge percentage of them are underground. Mm -hmm. There's very few that actually make their home above ground of the solitary bees. Most of them are underground. Hmm. But um, yeah, but it's just, it's just, this is just a way to get started on having pollinators in your yard. That are very simple to take care of because most people want to have, they're interested in having bees in their yard. They just don't want to get, you know, into all the work of putting them, which is, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, these are just really, and the kids all really, I have a lot of kids that come and look at, look at my yard. My backyard is full of bees also because I have all these leaf cutter bees and then I've got my hives. So um, I do a lot of work with kids trying to get them to understand bees, um, to know the difference between bees so you know, they know which ones are they should stay away from <laughs> and which ones not to be so afraid of. So that's really good too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Right. And if you guys have any other questions, of course, you can always email me or give us a call at the Conservation District. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm hoping to do more of these, especially once we get into the spring and talk about spring planting. And then hopefully uh, season will be coming up too. And then we can do some more events outside. Hopefully the COVID stuff will also start to settle down so people are comfortable coming and um, so yeah, so thank you very much for coming. Of course, grab snacks if you want. If you did come to pick up seed, uh, we can help you out with that at this point. Again, don't be shy and take some tomatoes. Um, and yeah, thank you, you guys so much. Outside. And yeah, and you can absolutely look outside. The garden is open for the community. If you can't look now, you can come by any other time to check it out. So, cool. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.